energy system. Uh, Kathy, should we start with yourself? Okay, um, so I'm Kathy McClay and I'm head of future markets at the electricity system operator. Um, a fact about me is my first job in the industry was trading pump storage for a living, doing all the mathematical modeling, so I have a background in flexible assets. For me, um, storage is just another form of flexibility. All of the analysis shows that in a decarbonized electricity system, flex flexibility is going to be really important. Can people hear me in the back? Yeah, my voice carries really well. I know that from the past. Um, Not one I usually have to worry about. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, flexibility is going to be really, really important in the future. I'm technology agnostic. But storage is going to be a really important part of that flexibility. Okay, excellent. Um, just to say a little bit, I mean, head of future markets uh, and the kind of the way that that you know what if what's your if you'd sum up your job in kind yeah, of one, one so, line, so it's, it's about if the lights go off. Is that your yeah, your thought, uh, well, or off in five years? <laughs> well, the head of operations would say it was my fault. Um, um, but the the role of my team is to ensure that the markets that we have for actually electricity, gas, and the capacity market, including our balancing services, are designed to work in the low carbon future, but also to work to transition to the low carbon future. So when I came in to the system operator about three and a half, nearly four years ago, I came in as head of commercial, and one of my main jobs was about trying to reform our balancing services to really open them up to new small players. And now we're looking at, I, I've moved over to look at the wider markets, <coughs> code governance, etc. And if you told me three years ago I'd put up my hand to do code governance, I'd tell you you were crazy. Um, but if we don't sort it out, because we've got so many people trying to get into the balancing mechanism, etc., if we don't so solve our code governance as well, we will never get that transition and we will really slow things down in flexibility. Okay, just one f further question. The, um it was a, I think, welcome example of, of leadership when you talked to the system operator talked about running a zero carbon mm. system by 2025. Uh, just to, what, what is there a sort of is that for an hour a day? Yeah, uh, a year, so it's initially, I suppose it's a bit analogous to what's happening with the coal free days right now. It's only two years ago we had the first coal free day, then it's like Less than a month ago, we had the first coal free week, and we made it onto Leonardo DiCaprio's Instagram page, which I'm particularly <laughs> happy about. And now we're over two weeks. We see it as the same thing. We're it probably start with an hour and then ramp up. But the key thing for us is that we don't want to be a blocker to any of that decarbonisation. So we have to have the markets in place to allow that to happen. That's not just about response and reserve. That's about voltage management. It's about having inertia markets because we we don't want to displace the low carbon megawatts on the system. So we have to be able to get inertia on our system without the megawatts. So it's all of that stuff. So um, let me say what we do. First of all, how is that energy as a storage business? But we're focused particularly on the optimization and trading of battery storage assets and primarily other people's assets. Um, so we're building a platform that can deliver revenues with this merchant uh, business model. So you're buying power when it's cheap and selling up when it's expensive, to put it simply. Uh, we're focusing on the day, the interest and the balancing mechanism that he's been talking about. Um, and we think that's a really exciting application of battery storage because it's, it, it's arguably the largest opportunity for one thing. Uh, many, many gigawatts of capacity we think could be usefully applied with that model. But it's also one of the most complicated uh, to operate and trade a battery in that way it takes a huge amount of data, it takes a huge amount of forecasting sophistication. We're using artificial intelligence and a full trading team and, and a lot of other resources being thrown in for doing that really well. Um, ultimately it's about, as I say, physically operating, but right now where the industry is at, we're also finding one of the second points, and I'll say more about this later, is making these projects investable, making them financeable. Um, and it's terrific to see that pipeline that we saw earlier. There are undoubtedly bigger lots of sites out there. But my question would be how many of them have actually got the funding to be built and it would be a relatively small proportion. That's where a lot of the action is now. And I think when you bring that, that trading capability view, it's about helping people understand it. It's about giving some confidence that the value is already there. It's about uh, financial innovation and other innovations to, to de-risk that and make it attractive to the big pots of money that are out there for funds and pension funds and so on. Uh, so that's what we're doing. We want to see those people lots get built. Um, and so the resurfaces, obviously, in addition, but, but some merchants are now our main focus today. 
Okay, excellent. I wonder if I might just ask for a quick uh, show of hands of anyone who's involved in a battery story, uh, or battery storage, or indeed any type of electricity storage project, which they think will get, which they're, they're, they're feeling confident will get built next, let's say this year or next year. Okay. I might ask how many of you have got funding, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you might answer those. Okay. Maybe. <coughs> Probably good to get uh, giving this a positive sign. So uh, some uh, kind of in, encouraging uh, <coughs> signs. Um, okay, uh, uh, let's go to uh, Mike. Uh, Nesco obviously been very active in this space. Deploy quite a lot of batteries. Been very active. I know getting the balancing mechanism working. How, how do you see the kind of value of storage I emerging? But it sounds a little flippant, doesn't it, just to say well the value of storage is in flexibility? But I think. When we in the industry have talked about flexibility, we haven't picked up on Kathy's point. It is not just flexibility in terms of being able to store renewable power when it's out of there and going cheap, and then releasing it when the price is high. It's also looking at how a flexi flexible asset can maximize the utilization of the power system as it is today. And that's the area where I think we're not really looking right now, and I think that's gonna open up huge new opportunities. We're not going to be able to rebuild the power system to uh, take all of the new wind and solar that inevitably is going to come on. So how do we use the existing assets? How do we make sure that when the wind isn't blowing, actually they're still being utilized? And it's through strategically placed storage assets that we can maximize the use of those assets. I think that's a key point. I can talk more about how we do exactly what Ben's talking about, but I think that's a more commonly well-known uh, a revenue stream now, uh, providing those, uh, finding those routes and market partners like Ben and the other aggregators out there who will make sure they're doing that in the most efficient way possible is absolutely key. But to make storage stack up and more importantly, to ensure that storage enables a new carbon future, it also has to deliver on those other things. Okay, do you elaborate a little bit more on those other things, what you have in mind and how that might turn into revenues? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, if we go for an area like the southwest of the country right now, very high penetration of solar down there. Now, if people want to build more solar, they're probably going to build it in the south of the country. That's where you have very high radiation levels, and that's where you, <coughs> to, you, know, you make sure you're earning your revenue. But there's limited both distribution and transmission resource down there to get that power <coughs> to the country, uh, sorry, out to the southwest. Actually, by providing storage assets in that area, you can store that solar power when it's generated and then release it later on in the day. But that's not just when the price varies, that's also when actually there's just physical constraints on the system. So it's not just looking at, if you like, arbitraging the market, but also arbitraging capacity on the system. Okay, would you be looking to DNO stroke DSO for assets? I think Steve's here, isn't he, Steve Atkins? Is Steve going to pay you for yeah. Um, I think there will come a time when they, they will, they will have to, because as any asset owner will know, it's incredibly difficult to build large linear assets, not just in terms of financing it and making sure that the regulated returns are correct, but getting planning permission on long linear assets to get HS2 is incredibly difficult. It takes an incredibly long time. And if we're reliant on those being built to meet our carbon targets, it just won't happen. Okay, we'll be hearing from uh, Steve later in the day from the DSO perspective. And um, finally, uh, Javier, you the uh, quite a lot of focus on the battery storage side. You know, is the are we focusing enough on longer term storage? I mean, definitely, when you I feel like a, like a little kid in a candy store. I mean, when listening to the topics and the questions, so I was raising the hands, so I'm really giving hope that indeed there is long duration energy storage being built, and not only being needed but being built. And, in the time heading hydropower technology company having a cryogenic energy storage, so it's a large battery cooling down, storing that energy, and then releasing back to the grid. So we talk then about megawatt hours and gigawatt hours. So uh, let's say the sweet spot is eight hours, ten hours, so, so for that, uh, in that sense, I, I like to share that I, I mean, the same that uh, Kathy was coming from the pump hydro. I need to confess, I come from the diesel uh, part of the energy industry. So I was heading Barcelona, diesel engine company, with 170 countries, uh, 67 gigawatts. I was heading the energy business there. 
and uh, we were moving some years ago into solar and uh, into energy storage and 2016 and 17 we in Barcelona when I was there we were the second largest integrator of, of batteries of lithium ion batteries and, and we made 300 350 megawatt which were 350 megawatt hours too so um, and just to mention that in those two years we made 10 gigawatts in, in the diesel and, and gas engine business that we have. So, <coughs> so that's why I ended up uh, chasing pump hydro and compression and then look at hydro power as the, as the long duration, something that is modularized, is standard, easy to deploy, having the same competences and capabilities of a pump hydro, but you can put it in a box and deliver it to the right place and the right size. So, and we're having enough focus. I mean, if you talk to anybody, in this room that you all know a lot about this, but if I ask in my neighborhood here in, in Westminster area, uh, they, they would say that batteries is, lithium ion is the dominant technology in, in energy storage, but everybody talks about it, even Leonardo DiCaprio and Elon Musk, they have really a very, very high level of followers. But I mean, I always tell to my parents and my wife and my kids, I say, no, it's, it's pump hydro, it's the largest, it's much more, much more cool and much nicer. We are coming to do the same. So I love lithium iron. I have two in my pockets and all in my bag. So, and I hope to have a car with it when I am in London. But definitely, we need all technologies. So we need really the biggest penetration, the fastest. So that's why lithium iron it needs to make a big bang. We need to come with larger, longer duration technologies to, to, to really guarantee the flexibility, the security of supply, and, and the decarbonization. Without, without doing anything to enable those investments, getting the financeability of those investments, or getting the revenues out of the asset. These assets can be operating 24 seven, doing stuff, doing, giving value, that needs to be paid for it. And then you need to be able to invest and finance. And, and the systems in general are moving, but it's low. I have to say that UK is definitely in the forefront of, uh, of movement, which is much faster than anywhere else in, in the planet no matter the, the distinguished guests that we have in London today. Uh, you might think that uh, all the country is doing better because you are leading the way, but still, we need to lead the way faster. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Harry. Um, uh, Cathy, just the, the question of, you know, what if you were the key revenue stream, the key value area for storage in your future market, you know, Why? is it... It's, where do you see it? Balancing? It, it's going to vary over time, and this is one of the key things for me that... So when I worked for a, a storage business, I worked for them for five years, and we made pretty much the same amount of money every year, believe it or not, but we didn't have long-term contracts. We did some stuff six months a year ahead, but the way we made it each year was quite different because these are highly optional contract assets. So if you lock them into long-term contracts for one thing, you lose a load of the value. I, I think at least a third of our value of our asset was option value because you can switch between the markets. So it's about, the flexibility is not just about having a flexible asset, it's about having a flexible strategy that allows you to move between the markets. So there's a really interesting report down from the Committee on Climate Change by Pori and Imperial College that we're looking at, looking at the value of flexibility in a low carbon world. And they were saying by 2050, the cost of balance in the system could be eight billion more in a, in a zero carbon electricity system if we don't get it right with the flexibility. <coughs> Some of that comes from avoiding builds of new lines, that's a big one. Um, but you need fairly long storage, perhaps, to, for the time the constraints there. Uh, a lot of it is about keeping the low carbon on the system so that you don't have to overbuild as well in the amount of renewables that you have so you're getting rid of less. And there's been so much focus on the ancillary service market so far, but and that will be bigger than what it was in the past. But if you remember, that's always been the cherry on the icing on the cake if you like a lot more kid if you look at the wholesale market the wholesale market's about 35 billion a year the balancing we spend one billion on balancing costs but everyone's been focusing on that one billion and there'll be some from the capacity market as well but it's not going to be ancillary services that's going to be the main thing in the future okay ben you're nodding your head there yeah, yeah that doesn't move on that. i think optionality is, a, is absolutely the right word to use when you're talking about the value of storage, both physically and financially. Actually, maybe we sort of take it a step further and say, what do we mean? What timescale of optionality are we talking about? Because I think there's three. 
um, there's the very short-term optionality, as in the battery sitting there, they can charge or discharge with seconds of notice. Um, so as a flexible asset, that's amongst the best optionality that you can have. And you have, when you think about trading and optimization strategies, that's effectively what you're trying to monetize, is that very short-term hour-to-hour optionality. Then you've got the sort of week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month optionality, which is if the system suddenly needs more frequency response or more like start in a particular area, then great. If you're in the right location, grab a contract for a week or a month or however the market works. Um, and even beyond that, you actually got optionality in terms of how you repower the cells, what duration and storage you have, do you change technology in the future. Um, all of those things are actually contributing uh, to, the, to the system stability in a, in a really useful way and to the, to the investability of the asset in the first place. So I was just going to ask, how do you, when you're sitting in front of the bank manager, how do you convince him of that, that, <laughs> yes. that optionality? Absolutely. Well, that, that's the work in progress. And I think the industry is making great strides. We're involved in a lot of conversations with, with both lenders and equity investors on those types of topics. Um, I, I think you can get a long way. The, the fact that most of this optimization now is being done algorithmically uh, actually really helps because the answer to the bank manager of, uh, trust me, I'm a good trader, I can do a good job with this, isn't going to get you a bank loan. Um, but the principle of we have a platform and we can show you each individual dispatch decision that we've made in the last six months and we can show you how much money that's made and you can do this and get confident that that value will be there. Um, that gets more, more traction and I think that's where, that, where the progress is at the moment. Okay, uh, Mike, a similar question to yourself, I guess, and that's going to be trying to raise funding for projects and some success. What's the, what are those conversations like and how, how convinced are the uh, investors in the uh, value proposition? Yeah, I have to admit, when Inesco asked me to come in and look after their batteries, I didn't realize quite how much time I would spend sat in front of banks. Um, but it, it's, it's been interesting. And I think at the moment of saying, these assets are out there, they're in the real world, show me the real data. But obviously, we've only got sort of six to 12 months of real data. And the nature of a highly flexible asset that's trying to capture volatility is that those revenue streams are volatile. Now, over the long run, they're consistent. But they're volatile when you look at any short-term piece, and it's you know, educating banks and investors, funders, to understand that that's the case, and actually it's the long run that you need to look at. Again, bringing on board the right partners, you can help demonstrate that. So it's not just an ESCO as a developer, obviously has a vested <coughs> interest in selling the asset, trying to raise the funds, but bringing in partners who are commercially aligned to the investor, who will say, actually, we want to partner with you on this. We only earn revenue when your asset earns revenue that's really where you change that argument. I think the other point I would pick up on is around ancillary services, which I agree with Cathy on. You know, we're looking now at when we build our models to say, okay, there are no ancillary services in it. Does this still stack up? Ancillary services are upside if we get them. But the, the asset has to stand on its own without any ancillary services. Excellent, okay. Javier, do you want to comment on the, where you're seeing the key value stream from, from your perspective? I mean, definitely, I, I feel a lot of total empathy. I mean, I don't see any really large difference between large scale and, and small or medium scale energy storage. I mean, as you said, I mean, I'm mechanical engineer, so I'm in front of the bankers and the financiers all the time. And it's, I'm learning, I'm learning, but it's, uh, it's exhausting because indeed you need to explain, you need to explain <coughs> that whatever is today is definitely not what's going to be in one year from now. It's totally different to what's going to be in three years. Everybody understands it, but of course the natural tendency of the ones who is funding is to okay, let's, uh, show me, let's wait one year, let's wait two years, let's, let's wait. And, and that's something that the, the system cannot uh, cope with waiting, and, and we need to, to get this happening uh, now. So so bankability, I mean, we have a, a set we are building, uh, we're building at the end of this year our first really large project is, is 250 megawatt hour is, is in the UK, but, but we need to go full equity with it. I mean, we need to get partners who really trust on the business model. It's, it's very easy to trust, but at the same time, I mean, if, if you look at the traditional way of funding, it's totally opposite to, to these long-term contracts that you have full certainty for the coming almost 10 years. And that's, that's the, the system needs to help in enabling uh, these technologies to get into into the grid because nobody challenges that it, it will work, it makes sense, but of course when the two walls, the, the, the grid and the finances get together, then, uh, then, then there is really a wall uh, that we need to break. Uh, please add something there. I, I think a lot of this is also an unintended consequence of the subsidized regime. And that prior to subsidies, if you were going to build a power station, <coughs> this is exactly what you would be doing. You'd be looking at, you know, how would you sell your power, how would you top that up from things within the BM? Would you get any ancillary services? 
Now, under the subsidized regime, you can basically build anything and know you're going to get a guaranteed return for 15 <coughs> years. So investors and funders expected this absolute certainty and a high level of return, which wasn't expected before that. And it's going to be a different world going, going forwards. Excellent. OK. Uh, let's come out to the uh, room then. Who would like to throw in a comment or question? We do have some roving mics, I think. Uh, you could uh, give us your name, rank, and serial number. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ajay Lawali. I'm a principal electrical engineer at Equinor. Um, firstly, thanks very much for the insights this morning. Really interesting. Um, question, sort of a bit more towards yourself, Kathy. Um, I like the idea of talking about some of the future values. Um, with the SO uh, Future Energy Scenarios Report, which I think is coming out this month, are there any sort of uh, insights you can give us into that and what we might expect? Well, unfortunately, I'm not involved in FAIRS at all. That's the strategy team. Um, but if you think about it, FAIRS is a sort of look forward for quite a few years. So if it's dramatically changing every year, there's something wrong, in my view, about but I think one of the key things when you look at FES is last year we created two scenarios that met the, the targets in quite different ways. Um, one of them was through, both of them were very distributed scenarios, but m one of them had more nuclear and CCS. And if you do this sort of rough back of the envelope calculation, they cost about two actually. Um, the key thing that we need to sort out is it's the summer winter problem on the electricity system and the decarbonisation of heat are, is the biggie. Like, you, you've got long term storage, but it's not quite long enough to store um, solar from the summer to use in the winter. So that's why I think some of the, I hate the term cross vector, but cross energy system stuff could be interesting, like how you go from, um, how you, how you can, for instance, use power to gas and things like that as storage. So is there other mediums as well? Because we're talking very much about electricity storage today. Mm -hmm. And transferring it into another medium could be really helpful <coughs> to getting that complete decarbonisation, including heat. Uh, OK, thank you very much, Cathy. Let's uh, see if there's any other questions or thoughts in the audience. Thank you. Yeah, Laura? I'm going to kindly point it out that I haven't switched the microphone on, so if you can hear me better than that, 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 that would be probably the reason. Thank you. Really, really interesting. I was just uh, a question to Cathy and an, uh, a question to all of you. Um, when you're looking at developing markets, um, picking up really on Mike's point is, are they fully costed, i.e., is it the full system cost, i.e., the constraint issues, and looking at the overall um, system impact, not just in some ways a national um, resource or wholesale type market. Because I think it's quite important as we're yeah. starting to get different costs within the system, and actually a kilowatt hour might actually have very little cost, but actually we've got different, you know, the, the, the cost base is moving. And then a wider thing, really picking up on Mike's point, is when we look at the energy sector, do we really have the right investors in the energy sector? Because in many ways, they are looking for bankable, long-term returns, and not sort of you know rain collection, but in some ways, we've created <coughs> that sort of market. And actually, what you're talking about is a much more uh, flexible, entrepreneurial um, venture rather than um, long-term infrastructure investment. Uh, so, Ben, do you want to come to that first in terms of I mean, uh, some the, the question of where costs are and are we collecting? One thing I've noticed in government over the years, and I think you and I have been in meetings with Treasury and Co. have been kind of worried. We've looked at levelised costs and we said renewables and storage getting quite cheap, and they sort of worry that somewhere, somewhere there's some terrible hidden cost that that you, you know, isn't, isn't being captured at the moment and all this decentralised renewable storage stuff is imposing some terrible system cost somewhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, how is our sort of understanding of that? Your yeah, I can um, comment on that. So, so the question is how valuable is storage or any other asset for that matter? The requirement to that is valuable to whom? 
uh, valuable to the system in the broader sense of um, society, I guess, in, the, in the, the biggest measure. Well, absolutely, storage is terrific because it has all the great things that we know about. Is that same value on offer to the investor? Not necessarily, and that's where these little market design uh, issues become incredibly important. If there's any inefficiency in the in the markets, that mean the asset owner can't access that value. That's friction. That's a blocker to, to these investments actually being made. So the balancing mechanism is a really good example. It's where a lot of the action is for storage. It's where a lot of the value is. But 30 minute traded box is, is really too long for storage. Uh, storage would do much better if it was one minute or five minutes. It would be more physically valuable, and it would also allow the asset to be monetized more effectively and probably be yeah. more useful to the operator as well. So we're sort of in a, in a stage of working through and tweaking those markets that often have a legacy of being designed for coal and, and gas of 10 or 20 years ago. Um, uh, so that's on the value point. In terms of other right investors um, actually looking at this, um, I, I think yes would be my answer, but they need some education and they need some help. Um, the reality is if we want to build 10 gigawatts of storage, that's five billion pounds of, of capital that we need, and it can, can only come from those big pots of money. Um, infra funds and, and pension funds and the like. Um, they are scared of things they don't understand, and so it's our job to, to educate them and tell them uh, how this works and, and to make them feel more comfortable with it. I agree completely with Mike's point that this is a, is a process of giving them back to the headspace they were in 10 or 20 years ago when merchant was just what energy was. Um, and I think we can do that, but it, it's going to take a, a little bit longer. Okay, Kathy. So, yeah, in terms of market design, the answer is that we don't do it as well as we could right now. So if you look at something like my frequency response market, um, every month over 50% of the tendered volume comes from distributed assets. And in the last three or four months, only distributed assets have won in the tender. I'm given a price for them. I know nothing about the chaos I might be causing on the distribution system by dispatching that asset. Um, because. And, and actually the distributions people probably don't know either at the minute because we're not that mature yet. And this is why there's a big focus in all of our incentive scheme <coughs> on whole electricity system thinking. And if you look at, um, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at our ambition document for Rio 2 and what we're talking about in the market section. What I would really, I, for, for our well-established markets like Wisconsin Reserve, we want to move to day ahead and potentially within day because that gives a liquid deep price signal. It means things like demand side response and winds, which are know much more about what they're gonna do, we'll, we'll be able to play and also we'll know much more about what the system's doing and we'll be able to get our volumes um, <coughs> more correct. Um, but I also want to then say, I want to link into the DSO markets. Ideally what I'd like to know is that if I'm taking something on a, a distribution network, what's the cost of the constraint <coughs> I'm, I'm creating? And actually build that into my auction calculation. Now the issue with that at the minute is that most distributed generation does not get a firm connection agreement on the distributed network. So what happens when there's a constraint in many areas is that they just get pulled back and it will be pro rata. So you might have a diesel gen set and a, a solar farm and they could both get pulled back equally, but actually the solar farm is zero carbon. So I think one of the interesting things when we're looking at the DNO DSO space going forward is under Rio 2, what are they what are they encouraged to do in terms of developing markets? Because if we can get those clear pricing signals, we can make better economic decisions for the whole system, and I think that's really important. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Then those who want to read more about this can look at uh, Open Network Future Future Worlds. I think grandly titled uh, consultation, which sets out some of the kind of <coughs> thinking around these areas. Uh, and coming towards the end of our time, so let's take the la take any more points, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, so I think Chris had his hand up first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think from foot entity. Uh, it's a question really for Ben. Um, just one of the things that seems to be sort of starting to move in the storage market from, from an investment point of view is there are offers coming to light from people offering routes to the market that seem to be quite attractive to investors. We've seen floor price, we've seen um, central business availability model, which again is sort of looking quite nice for that sort of initial slice of the capex. Interested from your point of view, from a sort of from a merchant point of view, how do you feel 
um, I guess what your proposition has allowed us to use, and, and, and maybe it works in combination, or, or how do you see your place in, in that? No, thing no. We'll take a couple of them, just to get sure. a final chance and test the <coughs> memory on things that Anthony had a question from there. Very quick one, uh, Ben, again, you made a comment about um, innovative financial instruments. I mean, I've heard in my time about people looking to put stuff through inheritance tax relief. So it really seems that financial engineering is more important than storage and electrical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Can you develop that? The scats, yes. <laughs> we are here in the city, of course. So, uh, Thank you, uh, Mark Simon, uh, CEO of Real Power. Um, I just had one question, since we talked about the deployment of capital in the space, whether there was one message from each of you that is substantial, substantiatable uh, to educate and encourage investors. I think that's the, that's the, sort of the golden bullet. If it was out there, then would have told it to me. <laughs> but I'm trying to think from each of you, you can. Okay, excellent. Anyone else have last comment, yeah, thought, or? Uh, okay, so let's come uh, to the panel and ask them for a sort of, to try and pick up on those questions. I mean, they're kind of all linked, really, around investment and different modes of investment, uh, and then a kind of one key message to investors. Have you, Adrian? Absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, you, you that, I mean, Cathy, that's a uh, golden point, talking about the golden, uh, golden I mean, so, um, and your question about the the financial investors, the venture investors. So this is, this is. I don't see. I mean, I'm becoming a financial engineer, leader by leader, from mechanical or if you then go to electrical. But this is not a venture. I mean, this is a firm, consistent, reliable. But indeed, we're in the moment of transition. That is, is everything firm enough? But I mean, Kathy put the point that I mean, we have solar power, we have diesel generation, we have coal, and, and they are all fighting for the same uh, for the same dollars or the same pounds. Uh, the same electron, so that does not make any sense. I mean, so that we need really, we will really need, need to, I would not say banish, but penalize different generations in, in order to prioritize. I mean, I, I'm, I'm bringing a technology that indeed this, I mean, I, when I heard that uh, we have such a good irradiation in the south of uh, UK, I was a bit uh, impressed. I need to go there and, and have a look. So, I, you know, I'm from Spain. So, we off stand next time. You can come down there. It's very my, my <laughs> it's and 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 the certainty that the revenues are coming, and we have, I mean, in a, in a mechanical or thermal energy storage like our technology, we provide mechanical inertia, we provide rotating equipment to the grid, can be synchronously connected to the grid, so you really enable wind, solar, anything, and you don't provide electrons. So, in a way, the system is ready, the technology is ready, the finances do not know really, they need, a, they don't want to know, they want a lot of, they want all the cards open, they want all the same, they want to touch and feel. So let's make sure they, that they touch and feel, and let's be bullish as, as a sector, as an industry, as the grid. Let's be bullish to the financial community. Do this now. Oh, this is Excellent. Good call to arms there, uh, Harry. Um, Mike, do you want to? Um, yes, yeah, so a few points I can pick up on there. The, the, the floor price that was referenced, I mean, that was one of our assets. They've got that, and um, we're really proud to instruct that deal. Do I think floor prices are the way to go going forwards? No, I think they're necessary now to gain that confidence in investors. Um, but I think going forward, you'll give up too much value to lock in that floor price. Um, but it is the right thing right now if you can get them and get them at the right price. Um, and that obviously is an example of financial engineering, working out what deals can you structure to get the investor on board. That's why we went, we went that way. Is there a golden bullet? Um, if you find one, please tell me. <laughs> I, I, I don't think there is one. But fundamentally, what we're talking about here is a physical real world system and the need to deliver power to people's homes. The market around it is a construct that we've made up to enable the flow of money. And that market that we created functioned pretty well up until maybe eight, seven, six years ago. Now, things that weren't valued before are valued and are necessary on the system. And the market will change to value that. 
if we go back to the original Rubik's Cube analogy, maybe everybody here has graded them, I'm not, and I'll get to the point where I've got three sides, think I've solved it, and go, oh no, I've got to undo a few things here. And I think that's where we are. We will get there, but as long as fundamentally the thing that you have has a physical need on the system, the value will be there. Trying to get an investor to buy that message is somewhat more difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent, thank you. I was just thinking about how we as a, uh, um, the point about uh, you know, differentiation values to low and high carbon technologies, which kind of flies in the face of Ofgem's uh, aim for a low, for a level playing field. So that uh, as, as their key key aim, or, or perhaps not if they, they think that someone else is responsible for allocating that, that value. But that'd be an interesting discussion to have with Francis shortly. Um, uh, Cathy, should we? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I, can I just come back on that? The carbon price is what you do that, Merlin. Uh, other, if you've got a proper carbon price, no one has to make any arbitrary interventions, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult getting a good carbon price. I think the key thing for me is that the system's in transition, and it's happening far quicker than any of us imagined. You can just see that with the coal generation, and will it all still be there up to the day it's supposed to close? I think the answer to that is no. If you look at it, as there's more and more renewables in the system, we need more a more flexibility to manage that. And the stuff that provides our flexibility is the stuff that's running less and less. So there is a definite need for new flexibility in the system. The timing of that is difficult to say. Um, certainly in the frequency response market, we've got probably an oversupply right now. You've seen the prices drop from about 15 three years ago to three today that's markets working that's great for consumers but it's a story that how you tell the investors that and what's going to happen in the market next um, but the opportunities are there but the timing of it is uncertain right now is what i'd say okay thank you kathy last word um yeah i, I think the key to getting the financing in place getting these projects away mm -hmm. is uh, well there's a, a series of steps i think the first one is get the project irr in a raw, unlevered sense, as high as it can possibly be. And that means doing it at scale, first of all. Um, this is a game now for 50 meg uh, projects and, and above, if you're going to see really competitive capex and, and good economics on these, on these projects. Um, you need to bring all the value out of the, the trading revenue. Um, a simplistic approach where you just buy power in the, in it overnight and sell it into the evening peak is going to make you 10, 20,000 pounds per megawatt hour per year. That's not enough to justify a new build project. You can do two or three times better than that if you're looking at every element of the trading optimization value that's there. Put all that together, you should be able to get to IRRs in the 10 to 12 to maybe even 15% level if you've got. Uh, all of those things in your favour. That should be investable on a risk return basis and raw economic terms, that is an attractive investment. Now, the problem is infrastructure funds are saying, we only want an 8% return, but we don't want the, the risk. So how do we bridge that gap um, and actually carve up that risk return into possibly different tranches? Now, I think the revenue flaws or the revenue guarantees are the industry's first attempt at doing that. It's a bit of a blunt instrument, it's pretty crude. Um, first of all, those flaws don't last for long enough to really de-risk the, the whole capital investment. You might get three or five or so years. Um, the revenue floor itself isn't at the level that really makes any difference. The same uh, operators who, who think they, they can deliver fantastic amounts of value way up here, and then you ask them for a floor up there, and they say, oh no, no, the floor's way down here. Uh, so in that case, is it really helping me? If, I, if that floor's actually doing anything, then it's, uh, I'm in trouble. So, so I think that doesn't really solve the, solve the problem necessarily. It's a, it's a good start. Um, debt coming in is, is always going to be a good sign that the industry's reached a, a certain level of confidence and we are seeing that starting to happen. There are two or three lenders out there now who will do, and they're not the, the 70, 80, 90% levels of debt we saw in peakers, but you will get 40 or 45% on an asset finance basis. And that's great because that, that shows that there is some ability to, to bring down the, the cost of capital. There are other innovative mechanisms uh, people are looking at. Tolling arrangements are an interesting one. Can you just rent the storage asset off someone and give them a 5% return that, that's guaranteed? And then someone else can take all the flexibility and try and monetize it. Uh, we're working on that at the moment in a few, few different variations. So something will emerge, but this, this fundamentally, it, it, it ought to work and it will soon. Excellent. Okay, well, I think on that note, we'll draw the first session to a close. Really uh, fascinating insights into the development of the sector and starting to really focus in on some of the kind of engagement with investors and the messaging and, and structuring things correctly. So uh, if we could thank our speakers in the usual one.